We are still in Brace Suck 21. <laughs> yes, we are. I'm Spencer. And I'm Daniel. Now, if you're <laughs> relatively new here, you might be wondering why are we doing a documentary on Jimmy Savile. But if you are an OG of this channel, <laughs> you know it was the first of the many faux pas we've made in the past. Not a lot, but ones that have gotten the most conversation going. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to cl- cut right here and show you the little clip that we're talking about. Jesus, poor Jimmy, Jimmy Savile. Oh my God. <laughs> this what guy did has this to be dude bad. do? Oh God. So, uh, because of that, unfortunately, because of how social media works, the more comments something gets, the more engagement it gets, the more views it gets. We didn't know at the time who this guy was. We didn't know. I, I, I remember thinking he was a footballer because I didn't know what it was. I was right. like, why do they keep saying this? And I was like, they said it so much so where I thought he was actually on the pitch with the players. Yeah, yeah that's oh what my I God. thought too. <laughs> But Dude, we were we ate our words, wrong man. on all times. Him, <laughs> Gary Glitter, Philip from this morning. Oh my God! I uh, had no idea. But we want to take the time and understand what it is that Jimmy Savile did. I mean, we've well, gotten yeah. hints of it from our comment section. Based off that, I'm just gonna go ahead and say if this kind of subject matter is not for you we'll understand if you don't want to watch this we have plenty more videos over a thousand of them at this point a thousand guys and we'll just say viewer discretion is advised yes any more (laughs) thoughts before we go in dan i i I think that i'm not even going to try to formulate words i i just feel like whoo man this is going to be a weighty one but hey that terrible saga is over (laughs) it Mm -hmm. ended and Let's see if we can learn how. This is the journey of knowledge. Viewer discretion is advised. We're going to go ahead and go in now. Let's do it, man. Three, two, one. For years, he was a TV and radio superstar and a friend of the rich and famous. He was pretty much ingrained in the nation's consciousness. Nobody tells me to do anything, baby. Oh, I tell them what's happening. He had friends in the very highest echelons of society. Mm. But since his death in 2011, the sinister truth about Jimmy Savile has been revealed. He was just sadistic in what he wanted to do and what he wanted other people to do. Jimmy Uh. Savile, once one of the nation's favorite stars, adored by millions of TV viewers, is now regarded as one of the country's most prolific sex offenders. His preying on young victims and just how he was allowed to carry on abusing children for decades are crimes that shook Britain. All right, so already, like, seeing him... (laughs) mingling with greats like the current king of britain like yeah. ugh, and it, how it's whew. yeah so we've already gotten a uh, little bit of what's to come for this documentary i i i just i just feel like oh my god it's gonna be heavy for some people but hear me out on this if if there is something i'm um you know not in any way, shape, or form trying to promote this guy's name because death was far better than what this man deserved. Um, you know what I mean? I just, I feel like knowing where all these references, he's his name has been referenced so much in every insult from in-betweeners to football chants and, and, and everything, in between. Show, everything in between. This man's name has been said in reference in a derogatory way right and and obviously so but i'm just like this is another piece of what makes the culture culture and this is this is interest uh, interesting this is historic this yeah, yeah. right here it's something that now we will get the context of yeah. a lot of those jokes that we have seen in all of the things we have checked out comedy yeah. wise and otherwise yes so it's it's a piece of the puzzle yes, that we it need is. to understand a lot of them. Yep. So. 
On the 9th of November, 2011, a funeral cortege moves slowly through the city of Leeds. The streets lined by a respectful public. They weren't there to say goodbye to royalty or a head of state, however. They had come to pay their respects to a DJ, charity worker, and much-loved icon. It was absolutely worshipped by thousands and thousands of people. You couldn't move in Leeds when it was a funeral. The seats were packed solid, you know, traffic was stopped, everything stopped. At two this afternoon, Sir Jimmy Savile's gold coffin made its way down Cookridge Street in Leeds. I can't think of any media celebrity today who is more famous than he was then. Flags at half-mast outside Leeds General Infirmary, where he'd raised so much for charity. Wow. He was a demigod. Just days later, however, stories began to emerge that confounded the country. Rumours that had circulated for years were coming true. Jimmy Savile, once the nation's favourite entertainer, was in fact a rapist, a sadist and a paedophile. Oh my God. Jimmy Savile was born in Leeds on the 31st of October, 1926. As a young man, he worked as a coal miner before an injury forced him to change career. He became an entertainer and began running several nightclubs in the north of England. It wasn't long before his reputation preceded him. When Jimmy Savile first came to Leeds, no one knew him. And after a month, everybody in Leeds knew him or have heard of him because they are outlandish things that he used to do. The way he dressed, the way he did his hair, for instance, you know, just, just to get himself noticed. You know, if he came to our house, there'd obviously be a couple of, I'd say a couple of dozen, it could be a couple of hundred people all outside the house and round his car. And, you know, so you'd obviously walk down with a big chest and you'd head all day, you know, saying, oh, is that my uncle, sort of thing. We never went out saying, you know, we've got a famous uncle called Jimmy Savile or all like that. He was just Uncle Jimmy and that, and that were it, really. He was a well-known figure in the north of England. He was a, a sort of an amateur disc jockey who hadn't really broken into television yet. And he introduced dancing to records, which had never happened before. He started for younger people on a, on a lunchtime, just dancing to records, and it really took off. Jimmy Savile began working at the Locarno nightclub in Leeds in the late 1950s. Dennis Lemon was employed by the club and became Savile's unofficial minder. He tried to give himself this reputation of a tough guy in a restaurant and all this, that and other, and I think he was as soft as anything. Mm. He just wanted somebody at his shoulders in case somebody did take a swing. Even as his showbiz... Okay, so... Early on, this dude was a attention whore. Yeah. Like, he wanted all eyes on him at all times. Yep. Yeah. Like, like, that's just the makings of someone that would do something to exert power. I, yeah. That Narcissistic. Will... Narcissist. 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 Yep. That's before it became, you know, a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Who? So, like, already planting the seeds of mm. this thing. Career was taking off. Jimmy Savile began to be dogged by accusations. When I was talking to the assistant manager one night, and Jimmy came through and through the door, and uh, evening Jimmy, you know, and just walked straight past us. And I said, what's wrong with Jimmy? He said, he's a bad boy. He said, he's got a lot on his mind. I said, what's wrong with him? Nice, he's in court tomorrow. What for? He says, uh, messing about with girls. And I thought, well, he may have taken one out and, as the phrase goes, tried it on and it didn't work and they've complained about him, you know. And uh, that was that. Nothing else said. Until next time I was on duty, a couple of nights later, and I happened to say, how did Jimmy go on in court? So I said, oh, it never got to court. It got thrown out, case dropped. And how did he manage that one then? He said, uh, same as he did last time, he said he paid him off. Oh, oh Having shit. narrowly escaped any charges by paying off his accuser's family, Savile apparently felt no need to curb his behaviour. What's a... Oh, so it's a case of 
Oh, money. No. Money will fix it. Oh, my God. Kind of uh, unfortunate t- uh, terminology there based off of his show. Oh, my God, dude. All right. Mm-hmm. Amazing is, is how brazen he was, how public he was, even then. I think he's just a, an individual who probably felt that he was fairly untouchable. I mean, you know, he was, he was quite an imposing figure. In 1968, 15-year-old Guy Marsden, Savile's nephew, along with three friends, headed south from Leeds in search of adventure. The young teenagers found themselves at Euston Station in London, where they were approached by two men. I would have said about 30 years old, rock and roll, with leather jackets and long hair and that. And they were just saying, you want to come to our place and that. You've got to try to remember that there were no such thing as perverts. There were, but you, you didn't hear them. Don't even a name paedophile out then, I don't think. So we just thought, oh, the like us, you know. So anyway, we ended up going with these back to their flat. At the time, Guy and his friends were unaware of the motives of the two men. Only recently has he found out the truth. These people would pick people up from train stations, as in younger people. We'd then go to their houses. And then the, the ones higher up the chain would come to these houses to see all they'd picked up, to take them elsewhere to do whatever they were going to do with them. Only days later, Guy was stunned when Jimmy Savile himself visited the flat. His first thought was that his family had tracked him down and they had sent Savile to bring him back to Leeds. The truth would be far worse. And then my uncle Jimmy came in, and he came in with his vicar and some kids. I thought that my uncle Jimmy had caught me there because, I mean, I was proper scared if you know what I mean I what certified if you want but now I'm 60 I think he didn't catch me I caught him mm. wow only recently has Guy been made aware that Jimmy Savile far from being a lone predator seemingly played an active role in supplying children to a network of child abusers in London oh uh oh here we go now I had no oh, conception of paedophilia at all child abuse at all, neither has any other three. So to us, our thoughts were, it's a party. You know, the people who live there, the man and lady who live there, are going to have a party. And it ended up where we were like, huddled together, four of us. And then these little kids would come over to us. As a naive 15 year old, Guy was never completely aware of the role he played. But it appears he and his friends were unwitting accomplices in the group's depraved activities. Oh my god, dude. He'd have been talking from six year old up to, I'd have said, ten at most. So there were young children. And then every so often, the, the, one of them would go, two of them would go. Still ne- never thought, never thought nothing whatsoever about it. These parties would last for days with various men from all sections of society arriving and taking one or more young children into bedrooms and abusing them. Oh my my God. God. I think most decent people find it incomprehensible that these sort of organizations, rings, whatever we want to call them, exist. But no less incomprehensible than why would anybody abuse a child? That the fact that people come together to do it seems in a way somewhat more scary because very often we're talking about people from well certainly people from all walks of life but including people from the upper echelons of society see this is the stuff this is why the 99 percenters don't trust the upper echelons of society yeah. it's because yeah. of things like this and the people twisted. associated with it the jimmy savills the michael jackson's the jeffrey epstein's the harvey weinstein's of the world man you know this is why that there's such disconnect between the the uh upper echelons of society it's, and why there's big distrust up there it's just it's like be what's beyond disgust and appalling that's where i am like 
that alone, if you just like, here's these things. Well, guess what? Guess who's going missing next week? This dude. Like, that's that. That's yeah. that. And, and it's just, oh, my God. I can't. He bought his way out of all of it. And that is the part that, oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. Fucking money, dude. It's I mean, money, we're not, even, we're not even 10 minutes into this. And we already get the context of a lot of those jokes now. Christ, dude. Mm-hmm. Man. To this day. Guy is still unclear as to exactly what role Savile played in the so-called parties. My uncle Jimmy saw him, I mean, he didn't even speak to us and acknowledges it, and every now and again you might have got a nod. He just seemed to come in, flitter about, you know, whatever they were doing, bringing little ones in and stuff like that, and then he'd go. I've recently found out that I were going to get a little bit police and things have called it groomed to do what the people down London were doing, i.e. getting the kids and, and probably grown, you know, old, older girls and older boys Holy shit, dude. to go to these parties up here in Leeds and places like that. In 1969, after a year in the capital, Guy returned to Leeds. Even now, over 40 years later, having witnessed the sordid events in London, he considers that he had a lucky escape. When I think back, I cringe because I think you could have ended up in bottom of Thames. They could have done out against you, saying you're a bit lonely or something. I think it's only because I was, you know, Jimmy Sellers' nephew, my uncle Jimmy's nephew, that not like that did happen. As the 1960s drew to a close, it would appear that Savile's appetite for abuse showed no signs of slowing down. Wow. As his showbiz career gained momentum, so did his ability to evade the attention of the authorities. How? About to find out. Had a huge amount of power. In everything in life, he used it to get his own advantage. Jimmy Savile, once a cherished national icon, is now vilified as an evil sexual predator who hid behind a smokescreen of celebrity in a career that lasted decades. After running several nightclubs across the country, Savile began working as a DJ, first at Radio Luxembourg, and then, in 1968, joining the BBC. Oh. One of his early roles was presenter of a typical radio discussion programme called Speakeasy. He was the printer. It was uh, another one of Jimmy's PR operations, you know, Jimmy Savile is getting... He certainly was on that programme, as he was on everything he appeared on time, and with the BBC. The whole organisation was at his beck and call. This ain't gonna go good. He had a huge amount of power, he certainly knew it, and constantly worked on building it round him. In everything in life, he used it to get his own advantage. After the recording of one particular episode of Speakeasy, Dave was offered a lift home by Jimmy Savile. As they approached Leicester, Savile suggested they pull into a service area for a rest. Uh-oh. Well, he suggested he was going to get his head down for an hour, and as it was early evening, I said, fine, I'd go into the service area and have a meal. Did just that. Came back after about, oh, three quarters of an hour to an hour. Tapped on the window of the motorhome to let him know I was here. And lo and, lo and behold, two young girls, 14, 15-year-olds, clambered out of the back, looking all scruffy and flustered followed by Jim. They were scrambling as if they were trying to get away from something. Wow. I know my suspicion, but the fact is that they were running from something. So he didn't say anything. The girls went away. We got back in the motorhome. They said, who were they? Oh, fans, it often happens. But then, total silence. Never said a word. The more and more I thought about it, I thought, I need to tell somebody what my suspicions are. Yeah, that's not just Holy a shit. fan interaction. I mean, no. we've, we've interacted with multiple fans here. I mean, many of them are cool. on our Instagram and WhatsApp and other channels. And, 
you know, there's there's certain lines you don't cross. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. But I mean, that's the and 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 I would I would just say like, it's oh man, it's just the dude, man. Sometimes it's it's just unfortunate that people just don't make a big enough deal about their gut feeling. Yeah, and and it's because you're terrified of let's say the power someone has, like yeah, because he's seen this guy get away multiple times from the law by buying people off, which mm. means he's nothing. He's nothing. He's just a pawn in this dude's evil fucked up game. So yeah, now we're about to find out what happened when this dude did mm. tell somebody. Dave raised the matter with a colleague, but was shocked by the response. They had a word with his line manager who'd said, uh, it's Jimmy Savile. We can't do anything or say anything about that. You know, we both need to keep our jobs. After what? that, I never watched him on television once. If he came on television, I switched it off. I never watched another Jimmy Savile program after that. Wow. So his, his people at BBC turned a blind eye because there was money to be made. Yeah, so he's basically un untouchable. Uh, just uh, it's interesting how like I feel like culture has changed a little bit because now it's just you say something. Well, now I guess everything's so connected and so easy to get your voice out. It's easier for for that to come out to light. There's so right. much stuff that you can document from the comfort of your phone. Just right, right. If this was in the age of Twitter or TikTok, then. He would have been off the air as That's soon as this so broke cool. out. Oh, my God. And dude. this would be a 15-minute documentary. Oh, my God. Yeah. In 1975, Saville began presenting the show that would make him a household name. Jim will fix it. The program was broadcast on Saturday evenings and ran for almost two decades. At its peak, what? the show wow. attracted viewing figures of 15 million with the production team opening almost 5,000 letters a day. Wow. I got letters just bombarding me. There were so many letters, and it was up to me to sift them and give them to Jim for his decision. But it was, it was hard, but there was a lot of letters, and it just grew like Topsy. And that's how it all started. Despite his on-screen persona, Savile's attitude to children was apparently different when the cameras were turned off. He did not like children at all. He tolerated them, but that's about as far as it went for the value wow. of the program. I think all children should be eaten at birth. <laughs> that's for sure. He had a set rules and he knew how far he could go. They might have sat on the arm of the chair, but that's as near as it got. What is apparent now, though, is that this seeming aversion to children was no more than a camouflage to ward off suspicion. A device Savile used throughout his life to stay ahead of the rumors that dogged him. Abusers off. Oh, it's a wow. facade. He was acting not only on camera, wow. but off camera, too, on the set. Can, can, can it, it's like if Dude. like Mr. Rogers or someone like that if you found this out about him that his it was all a facade like that's that would break my fucking the, heart but the level of psychoticness the level of of there's uh, there's there's a there's a term i mean just it's basically pure evil like yeah. to think about having a show with kids right knowing uh but but then on, on behind the scenes pushing them away because you know your ulterior motive and then behind that scene of pushing them away you're just this walking breathing piece of garbage and yeah. it, it's just but this that 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 hurdle that you have to freaking oh my god dude is is evil straight up his straight conscience up. is not clear at all oh like, my god dude it, it's not that hard to you know not do what he did it's not that hard <laughs> yeah. to not do it. Apparently yeah. not for this guy. This guy is just just evil, man. Pure, yeah, pure and simple. Pure evil. No. Yep. Often are most credible and charming people that you could meet. 
They're often very hard working. They often hold positions within authority, within society, of, of some standing. The other common denominator, of course, is that they are highly dangerous to children and can be highly dangerous when cornered. And I think that, you know, there was a man who clearly could be as charming as charming could be, but also was both highly dangerous, extremely threatening and very intimidating when he needed to be. Well, there's only one thing I can do now, and that's if you, if you cheat down there, Mr. Cameraman, I'll slap a bell at that. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. As well as his TV and radio career, Saville was renowned for his charity work, raising millions of pounds for several charities, including the Leeds General Infirmary and Stoke Mandeville National Spinal Injury Centre. Jim, because he was Jim, liked high profile things. Stoke Mandeville was very high profile. It was world famous for its treatment of the paralysed. Leeds General Infirmary was a big teaching hospital. So he generated to things that had quite a high publicity value. And as a result, he benefited, but so did the hospitals. Jimmy Savile may have raised around 40 million in his lifetime for charity, wow. but looking back, I think it's, it's easy to now see that his charity work was a very convenient camouflage for his activities and helped him gain access to vulnerable you know, young people, in fact, in hospitals, oh. in children's homes, in events linked to the BBC, and indeed, of course, his involvement with Broadmoor and the fact that he was actually given the keys to Broadmoor. Oh my God, I didn't even Broadmoor? think about... I, it's not the hospital, I don't think, but oh. still, like, that's why now these days like charity work is not really seen as what it's meant to be like when all these celebrities politicians athletes do charitable work you know most time the their ulterior motive is publicity yeah tax write-offs and in the case of fluffer nutters like this motherfucker yeah you, what we've talked about already like i said man this dude's just pure evil he had this evil game planned way before he made his moves which makes yeah. him all the the worst kind of evil if there's even a worse kind of evil like he is the one they dropped the prison on he's underneath the prison this guy yeah yeah broadmoor the high security psychiatric hospital in Berkshire There's is answer. home to some of the UK's most notorious criminals. Past occupants include Peter Sutcliffe, Charles Bronson, and Ronnie Cray. Saville had volunteered at Broadmoor for years, but in 1988 he was given a senior role along with a house on site and, incredibly, access to patients. The what? fact that he was given keys to a place such as Broadmoor, that he was allowed to walk the, the hospital wards where there were vulnerable children in Stoke Mandeville and other places, again, is incomprehensible. And yet nobody, nobody seems to be taking responsibility. Like many adults who abuse children, I think Savile preyed on the vulnerable and the weak. We still don't know the full sort of degree of what, what he did but it seems to be the case that he may have even abused disabled children in hospitals. Oh my god. Uh, we now know there were people you know in certain hospitals and at Broadmoor and elsewhere who were suspicious or indeed had heard whispers or even had had complaints from some victims but who I think felt that they would never be believed. You know if you're a friend of the Prime Minister you're photographed with these people, you are, you know, in the public eye. The idea that you might at the same time be abusing children is monstrous. Here we go with what's called a medical breakthrough. He had, if you like, all the establishment connections, even though he was eccentric, even though he was like a complete weirdo, that he was actually, he was actually, he, he, he was actually fated. 
As well as having almost unrestricted access to Broadmoor and its patients, Saville also managed to secure regular visits to Duncroft School in Surrey, a residential school that housed young girls who had been sent there by the courts. By the courts? The girls at Duncroft were certainly, although intelligent, were vulnerable. But Saville, I think, also worked on the principle that the mixture of his fame and the fact that he was treating them to things like trips to the BBC or trips out in his Rolls Royce, that this was, if you like, a, a thrill that, you know, that, uh, they, that they wouldn't get from, uh, from their normal lives in, a, in effect in an institution. So I think, he, I think he gambled on that, that that would, inf at the time, would actually guarantee their silence. <sighs> Uh, God, that's a recurring theme of this, is him trying to buy the silence yeah. of his victims. Wow. Like, just trying to hush them up with, you know, trips to the BBC, or money, or anything else. Dude, what the fuck? Like, Jesus, man. Jesus, Ugh. just diabolical, man. Just fucking trash of the earth. Dude. Yeah. I mean, even without all of this stuff already been said he just looks the part doesn't he 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 really does he kind of is that that guy you stay away from like, yeah i, I yeah. just uh, it's just fucking i don't know man it, just all creepy all creepy vibes just off the photo yeah, yeah. Just, just off the just photo off of, this, of who he was because I, I never knew what he looked like i never knew what yeah. he looked like i just know what he did you know yeah. so just who man Mm-hmm. Thing that moved seemed to be a potential victim oh my for God. Savile. But he clearly also was clever at targeting lots of very vulnerable victims as well. Girls in a school for troubled girls would have been, you know, manna from heaven. In 1994, Two women who had been pupils at Duncroft approached the Sunday Mirror newspaper, alleging that Savile had abused them as teenagers. They weren't looking for money. They merely wanted to see Savile exposed because they thought you know, he, was a, he was a hypocrite and found it hard to believe that he was almost you know, deified in some circles and, and that he, he was so well in with you know, very prominent, eminent people. Although the paper was keen to run the story, the two women were understandably wary of the costly and emotionally intrusive libel case that would inevitably follow. They decided not to proceed. Once again, Savile's power and reputation had served him well. I had no doubt about the veracity of their stories, but they had lost their nerve. In one case, she still had the, the courage herself, but she didn't want the embarrassment of both her past life coming out and or indeed of her being subjected to uh, you know to what would have been a merciless uh, cross-examination by a QC for Savile one had, would have had to tell them that was what was going to happen the second woman didn't want to be the, the lone witness but also oh. said and I will never forget this because it, it I think, I think it reflects a theme that we now know was common among Savile's victims. She said, who's going to believe me? An ex-approved school girl against Jimmy Savile with all his fame, all his money, and that being a house guest of Margaret Thatcher at number 10 and Checkers. And with hindsight, one, one knew that she was probably right. Although we didn't, we didn't run the story, some weeks later, I had a phone call from a QC, George Carman, at, at the time, then the most famous libel QC in Britain. George Carman, QC, was one of the country's leading barristers, acting for both celebrities and national newspapers. To the best of his family's knowledge, he had never formally represented Jimmy Savile. My father spoke to Paul Cognew. He was then editor of the Sunday Mirror. Uh, and my father had uh, worked with him in terms of giving uh, defamation advice in five or six different cases, I think. So he knew him reasonably well, and they'd also socialized a bit. So he found him to, on the pretext of talking about something to do with uh, a libel action with reference to the Mirror. And my understanding from Paul is that at the end of the conversation, my father apropos of nothing, suddenly introduced 
an observation saying Jimmy Savile's very grateful that you didn't publish that story about Duncroft and Paul was astonished. I was, for a second I think, taken aback that George Carman knew about it. Um, so my reaction you know, to George was, well, how do you know about it, George? You can only know because Savile's spoken to you. And he sort of gave a rather affirmative sort of chuckle. And my response was, well, well George, even though we, we couldn't prove the story because the two women involved lost their nerve, I actually believe them. And George Carman paused and chuckled again and said, Paul, I suspect you may well be right. I can quite... Like, the question now with, <sighs> with this guy is, does he have just as much blood on his hands for not running the story as Jimmy Savile does? Like, do all these people that have been hush-hush about this, how much blood is on their hands? My suspicion is a lot. Well, There's a I, lot I of blood just, on their hands. The, the newspaper, or the, what was it, the, the Post, right? Yeah. They can't run a story without people. Right, right. also get buried in, in, in money. That's what this dude was. Apparently, Jim will buy the ground from under you if it means keeping you quiet. So yeah. if you're a if you're a newspaper, he will bury you. Yeah, yeah and especially I guess. with no no one stepping forward because they backed out. Right, right, and you know it's uh, it's their story to tell if yep. at, at the time, but you know we can't fault them for no the culture Man. of the time was who is going to believe me? No yeah. one's going to believe me, dude. I'm glad oh. that I'm glad that narrative has changed. Yes, yes, one hundred percent, man. Wow, yeah. man. Yeah, so maybe not as much blood on their hands because it was self preservation at the time. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, and, and a newspaper can't just go and and run a story without the people that said right. it. Right, right, right. Which is kind of the advantage of now having social media. I mean, I I still believe that strong press and honest press is a good thing, but at the same time, social media is trial by fire. If yes, it really will hold your, uh, hold your. Hold you in the highest of courts of public yep. opinion. Yep. So, yep. so maybe that's an advantage of it in all the disadvantages of it. And that's what I'm saying. Like, I think this dude held the keys to the public opinion's courtroom. You know what I mean? Yeah. This yep. dude bought the keys. It's just, yep. just diabolical moves, man. Fucking, oh. Yeah, absolutely. To understand, he was astonished because, as far as he was concerned, only three people in the world knew about that story apart from the two girls. Uh, that was himself, the legal advisor, and the journalist who wrote the story. So the fact that my father knew about it, and therefore Savile knew about it, and that my father introduced it in conversation in this way, he found deeply surprising, as indeed do I. He had friends in the very highest echelons of society. Princess Diana and him were friends. Nobody messed with Jimmy Savile because he had connections that were unique, if you like, to, to somebody in his position. It was like he was the puppet master controlling everything that was going on. By the end of the 1990s, after a glittering career, Savile's showbiz star was fading. And whilst his TV appearances grew less frequent, his near-constant charity work earned him a knighthood. His armour of respectability was complete. It would be over 20 years later until the full, horrifying truth emerged. He enjoyed seeing pain inflicted and humiliation, I suppose. Jimmy Savile was a national icon until his death in 2011. He is now regarded as a wow. wicked, predatory sex offender who used his connections and reputation to deflect any allegations of wrongdoing. However, the public persona of Savile, the entertainer and showman, was at odds with how people actually viewed him when the cameras were turned off. Savile had long been regarded as a pretty suspicious figure by a lot of people in, um, in journalism, in Fleet Street, at the BBC. One, I'm very boring. I don't do drugs, I don't do underage sex, I don't do any of them things that they print in papers today. 
I think I've found several shifty, grubby, mock humility. He almost invited you to think of him as a slightly grubby, eccentric individual. I hope that cigar is not lit that you have in your hand. No, it's not lit. Jimmy Savile. Did no. the doctors not tell you to get off that? Nobody tells me to do anything, baby. Oh, right. I tell them what's happening. Oh. I feel that, yes, he, he hid his darkness in the light. You've been doing Jim will fix it for 20 years. Did anybody ever fix anything for you? Uh, yes, because my case comes up next Thursday. Right, and I hope you get off it. <laughs> no, it'll be a change if I get put away. <laughs> he didn't have a... Ugh, that phrasing of it is just not kosher at all. Mm -hmm. Just just the vibes, just the creep value, just fucking... Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, dude. Him, <laughs> oh, him smoking indoors was the least bad yeah. thing he did. Oh, my God. Personality. It was almost robotic. Not in his movements. But in his actions, he never ever showed any emotion other than when it was that false smile that he had when he was buttering you up on screen or on air. Never had showed any emotion of any kind whatsoever. A lot of people didn't like him. They didn't like him because of the way... A lot of people called him creepy. But he used to go round the wards saying things like... Uh, Oh, you're beautiful, and give me your hand, and he'd take their hand and he'd kiss the back of their hand, and it's, yeah, he, they, he wasn't terribly popular with the staff. No shit. Whilst people harboured suspicions about Savile, his status as a celebrity and fundraiser meant he was never called to account, allowing him to continue to prey on children, both as an individual and also as part of a group of child abusers. That's fucking... Stephen oh was God. only seven when he began to be abused at home. My father started it. Um, started being very... Um, violent. He used to drink quite heavily. Um, and it started from there. I suppose over quite a short space of time it escalated quite quickly from you know just being hit um to being kissed and touched and i don't know how many months um before others were involved as the oh. abuse got worse stephen was handed over to an organized pedophile ring oh my god Stephen was abused by the group for the next nine years. What? He would be collected from home at any time, day or night. And on occasions, he would even be picked up from school. He was taken to various locations, including houses and hotels, where he, and often other boys, would be subjected to the most appalling sexual abuse by one or more men. Ugh. Nobody questioned it, and you know, sometimes it was during the day, or the evening, or at night, or weekends it's that was just part of life really and <laughs> nobody said anything not, even, not a word it's strange because they never said don't tell you know you hear people say oh yeah we were told not to tell nobody ever actually said that um but it was made very clear that if you broke the rules um, or if you went against the group you would just disappear and no one would care. Oh my god, that's giving me chills, oh, dude. God, dude. That's... Oh my god. Oh my god, that's it's just it's oh my god in heaven. That's just just that's just so fucking kills me, man. Yeah. Kills me. His mannerisms, the way, the timber in his voice, like, you could tell that, like, even if he was talking about something else, he would, you could tell that something happened to him. Oh, my God, like, dude. of that yeah, that's, caliber. That's just fucking, oh, my God. Yeah. Mm -mm. Occasionally, Stephen would be brought to the group to be told that guests would be joining them. 
On more than one occasion, the guests would include Jimmy Savile. What you didn't always know beforehand. Um, sometimes we were told, so we were, you know, as I've been taken um, to wherever it happened to be, that there'd be a guest coming that evening or that day or whenever it was. Um, but not always. Um, no names were ever used. You know, just didn't use names at all. Um, and yeah, he came probably a couple of times a year over several years, just odd occasions. You know, there was nothing different about the event, it just that there was somebody different there. Did Savile abuse you directly? Yes. Yeah. He was just sadistic in what he wanted to do and what he wanted other people to, to do. Yeah, just evil and um, enjoyed seeing pain inflicted and humiliation, I suppose. Jesus. It was hard to comprehend um, because you know who it is when you're, you're sat watching TV and he's on the TV and... Oh, my God. You know, that's, it's just really a strange feeling. I think all of us were just objects and just the best way I can describe it is just sweets in a bag that you hand round and, and share. Oh. We meant nothing. Oh. We meant nothing at all. Jesus Christ. Stephen's abuse at the hands of the group stopped when he was 16. Only recently has he been able to talk about his horrific ordeal. Following the Savile revelations, he reported his abuse to the police. It's a scary prospect. It's probably more comfortable to not believe things sometimes than to confront them. Um, but we know that organised crime of this kind exists. And again, we need the police, the authorities, to have more resources in order to, to break them and to establish that the abuse of children in, in, in any form and by any perpetrator, organised or disorganised, is never, ever acceptable. I believe that as more survivors speak out, and many of us are, the authorities will be compelled to act. It might be a long battle, but I think it is more than a battle. I think it's a war that we're in, and it's a war to protect our children. Tragically, for Vic That's the perfect way to say it. It's a war for our children, and to be sure that they don't fall yeah. into this trap again. But but it's 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 a like what I don't understand, man, is that it's a war that that needs to be fought by fucking everyone, not mm -hmm. just a few individuals. Like that's my biggest issue with this whole thing, man. It's like the collective let everyone down. Yeah, like everyone what just stood by. I, oh my god, dude! Like this is a if there's any like you know how pissed off I get when it comes to like kid stuff man like yeah like oh, oh man it's just if you're gonna go to war man go to fucking war like scorched earth no survivors shit like that's yeah. that's where that's where the blind eye gets turned you know like hey we're going to war we know where these guys are that house these beings they're off the face of the planet mm -hmm. we that's don't how need it should them. be that's how that's it should how it be, should be. It used to be like that, you know what I mean? But mm. it's just, it's just, <sighs> mm. but, but those things, those types of specialized units um, that go and break the shit up and find out these detectives that do this work, they're just underfunded, underfunded and overworked. And there's so much of it. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, to, to the point of what I was saying earlier, this is why I, one of the advantages of social media is that you have the court of public opinion. Everyone's there. Yep. The Jimmy Savills of the world are not controlling it. No, 
no, this is, this is, this, this right here should never happen again. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, no. but it's just a sick and evil world we live in, dude. Hell yeah. Victims like Stephen, Savile's position as showbiz royalty, as well as his charity fundraising, once again ensured the rumors and gossip about his behavior remained exactly that. It would only be after Savile had died that the shocking nature of his crimes would be laid bare. It was good while it lasted, reads Jimmy Savile's headstone. The same can now be said of his reputation. Jimmy Savile is now regarded as one of the most prolific sex offenders this country has ever seen. Oh his reign God. of depravity lasted from the 1950s until his death in 2011. Throughout his life, he convinced most people he was nothing but an eccentric. But in 2009, allegations of abuse at Duncroft School forced the police into action. Savile was interviewed under caution at his office at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. When the police are investigating somebody about a serious crime, and this is a very serious crime, the su suspect would generally, surely, always be taken to a police station where they would be interviewed under, under caution. So that made it unusual immediately and again probably emphasised that the person in control of that interview was Jimmy Savile. It was not the police. Mm. From what's coming out in the press and most recently the, the, the transcript of his interview with Surrey Police the tone of the interview is one of almost, I'm sorry I've got to ask you this again, but you know, we've, had, we've had these allegations made to us, which is not really a, you know, a very confident way of, of, of putting a, an allegation to get a, a structured response. As, as well as his obvious denials of any wrongdoing, were the undercurrent of threats and intimidation within the interview. I mean, he virtually said, that he would have them in the courts if they messed with him. The authorities decided that given the lack of evidence, any pursuit of Savile was futile and the charges what? were dropped. Oh my God. One of the last oh chances to bring God, one of Britain's dude. most prolific child abusers to justice was lost. <laughs> God, that just now, makes me mad. But, but you know what though? That should have been enough. That should have been enough. That that should have been enough to, to kill his whole career, reputation, everything. It, yeah. If, if if you're accused of it, it's because you know what I mean. Like it's just it should have been enough to at least perk people's ears up. Yeah. Like, and the hey fact now. that it had been going away for been going on for like since decades now, like that should have been enough. But apparently like, not. Everyone was thinking it, and that's the first time it reared its head. Well, actually, you know what, Spence? It's the first time it was actually on record. Yeah, yeah, the first police so record of it. This was the first time he's been officially served or questioned. Yeah, so two, two and a half years before his death, finally. <laughs> Took them long yeah. enough. Jimmy Savile died in October 2011. Even after his death, a veil of secrecy covered the truth about his activities. In mid-December 2011, I got a call from a BBC contact of mine who told me that there were various people working at the BBC who were unhappy about the fact that a Newsnight investigation into Savile had been axed in what were described to me as mysterious circumstances. So I did some digging um, over a period of about a week and I discovered that indeed there had been a BBC Newsnight investigation into Savile and it had been axed. Wow. It was made clear to me that several witnesses, middle-aged women, had come forward uh, and some of them had spoken on the record about abuse that they had suffered uh, at the hands of Savile on BBC premises. So uh, I put this to the BBC press office uh, about three or four days before Christmas 2011. It took them 24 hours, but they did confirm that they had conducted this investigation. They told me it had been dropped for ed editorial reasons. I therefore had confirmation that the investigation had taken place. I knew what its contents were. Um, and I uh, tried to sell that story to seven national newspapers over the next two weeks. 
despite the robust evidence backing up the allegations, not a single newspaper decided to run the story. Oh my God. An executive from one very well-known newspaper told me that, in fact, uh, his editor had also heard stories about Savile, but decided that because he'd only been dead for about two months by this point, it would be in bad taste to run the story. The doors closed, really, and the, uh, the story was sort of of no interest to any of them, which, which amazed me. I suddenly remembered that there was one person who not only might have had some knowledge of Savile as an individual, but um, who was uh, you know, sure to run the story because he has a reputation as a mischief maker. That person is Richard Ingrams, the editor of the Oldie magazine. He'd previously edited Private Eye for about 25 years. I rang Richard Ingrams and uh, within 30 seconds he said that he wanted to take the story and he did indeed publish the allegations in full wow. in the February 2012 issue of the Oldie. Mm. The Oldie article was the, was the first occasion when any of the, uh, the allegations against Savile were, were published in full. On the 4th of October 2012, ITV broadcast Exposure, the other side of Jimmy Savile. For the first time, the whole country was aware of the allegations against the disgraced star. Wow! I think everybody in Leeds watched it. And, uh, not, you know, it's not very nice to, you know, somebody that you liked and trusted um, being such a character. I suppose my feelings were one of smugness self-satisfaction there you are i told you so disappointment that it's taken so long disappointment that the guy had died so he couldn't face justice but happy that it had come out the day after exposure was broadcast the metropolitan police launched operation utri looking into the actions of jimmy savile as well as numerous other allegations of historic sexual abuse the Metropolitan Police and the NSPCC painted a picture of abuse on an almost industrial scale. Over 450 individuals have since come forward to allege oh that Savile abused them. Most were under 18 when the offences took place. It doesn't matter how much money you raise for charity. If you are at the same time abusing children, abusing disabled people, robbing them of their dignity, robbing them of their childhood, making them incredibly unhappy, you know, you can only be a bad person and your legacy will always be poisonous. I think the Jimmy Savile outrage undoubtedly has a legacy. I mean, it has the legacy that, if you like, the can of worms is open, you know. The, the extent of abuse within society now is beginning to be accepted. You know, Jimmy Savile was one offender. He doubtless abused thousands of people during the course of his, his lifetime. But we know that there are many millions of other people in this country who have suffered abuse at the hands of all sorts of other, other people. And the legacy that should follow such an outrage is that we don't allow this to remain, be swept under the carpet any longer. I think it's helped alert the British public to the scale of child abuse, not just involving celebrities, but involving other corruptors, destroyers of young lives. I think that it probably means that the prosecuting authorities and the police now take complaints or evidence of abuse far more seriously. The police have been fantastic because that was a nerve-wracking experience and positives I suppose for my own life because I'm now much more grounded with it I suppose I know what triggers me I know what doesn't um, it's easier to live with now um, and hopefully that's going to enable me to get another relationship at, at some point wow man disturbing that political leaders who were, for example, so keen to 
call for the Leveson inquiry into misconduct in the press aren't doing the same for an overarching judicial inquiry into the much bigger and life-damaging consequences of multi-institutional failures in, you know, uh, over child abuse going back you know, 30, 40, 50 years. In October 2012, the elaborate headstone that marked Savile's final resting place in the North Yorkshire Cemetery where he was buried was torn down. He now lies in an unmarked grave. The staggering scale of Savile's abuse continues to grow, and questions still remain about how he was able to prey on young, vulnerable children for over 50 years. That's fucking... I think that is a reflection of how society views the crimes, that they'd rather they didn't think about them. And, you know, oh, Jimmy was that way. Well, Jimmy was a rapist and a child abuser. That's established beyond doubt. Lots of people knew nobody did anything about it. That's, that's the real outrage. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Let's pause I'm gonna it keep there. This yeah. up here while we debrief about <sighs> this uh, whole documentary. Man. We knew going into this, this was a big touchy, for lack of a better term, subject of yeah. the British public. But it's also, I feel it's good to put it out there and to discuss it so that it doesn't happen again. Yeah. We look at the people in power, yeah, up in the higher echelons of society, yeah. politicians, uh, social media stars, athletes, musicians, actors, all that we look at and enjoy their content on our screens, and you know sometimes look behind the curtain of what it is they're he doing. Heavily critique those that you admire. And, yeah. and and make sure that they are worthy of admiration. Don't get starstruck and put them on a pedestal. My biggest thing that just irks my soul is that he never met justice. That was my biggest irk as well. Is, you know, if you look at people like, like Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein, kind of Jeffrey Epstein, but not really. They served a bit of justice before they either yeah. died or they're still yeah. living and they, they, they still served a bit of justice. But it's not enough i'm fine with in these cases with the public drawing and quartering i'm fine yeah. with that what's sickening to me is that in these places that he went he was never alone there were other adults running the ring right like hold on burn that thing to the ground that's the thing that just it's just oh it's just like sickening man it's just there's no other word. It's it's vile, it's disgusting, it's pure evil. If you're going to be on the team, make sure it's the team that is protecting childhood innocence at all costs with yeah, every breath. And I think that's our overall calling as adults on this earth is to protect the innocence of children. Kids only get one childhood and yep. there's no turning back of it. Now I think we'll laugh even harder when a Jimmy Savile joke comes up. Holy shit, man. That is like the worst of worst of jokes. Like you know what I mean? Like now I mean, it's just it's just damn. I mean, it's not even a joke and matter, but holy shit, man. We know how thick skin you have to be across the pond. But yeah, now if, we... if they're gonna incorporate this evil son of a bitch into <sighs> jokes like that. It's just unfortunate. He didn't meet justice. Terribly. He was able to get away with it all the way up till he was in the grave. Man. And oh. you, usually we like to see some sort of happy ending to some of these things. Like even with, you know, the war documentaries, there were happy endings to all of them. With the Victoria Cross, the 13 hours that say Britain, but not here. Yeah. Not yeah, really no, here. This is, this is just... Uh, like unfortunate just oversight of just oh my god epic proportions it's just a tale of caution man it's like guys the, the shit happens and if you think this dude was bad there's probably a scumbag out there that's roaming the earth that's 20 times worse you guys if you've made it this far in the video we appreciate you watching with us as we take the time to understand the extent of what this man evil son of a bitch did and now we have 
that piece of the puzzle when it comes to y'all's culture. Yeah, holy crap, man. That was a tough one. It's, it's definitely a different out of the normal pace of videos that we have on here, but it's still part of learning and absorbing culture yeah. that has sh shooketh things across the pond. This was a good discussion piece. This... And, you know, it's a proof that we're not all just, you know, hunky dory, laugh at this funny uh, show type yeah. thing. We're about talking about real stuff. We, we can do that as well, guys. And usually when we talk about real stuff, it's just between us, man. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. but this is good. This is good to have this conversation uh, with yeah. everyone, finally. You know, just yeah. like, hey, boom, serious stuff on Embrace the Suck. Yeah, it happens we can every do now too. and again. Definitely every yeah. now and again. Thanks for watching. We won't do yep. our regular outro no. this time. We'll just no. say see y'all next time. Yeah, pay attention to that shit down there, guys. Don't so be silent. Look at that. Screenshot yeah. it. Yep. It's going to be yep. in the description as well. Yes. We love y'all. Yes. We'll see you in the next one. Later, guys.